Germany is marking the 30th anniversary of the reunification of the two Germanys, East and West. Following the fall of the Berlin Wall and the crumbling of communism, it seemed at the time like something of a miracle. But for the people of today's Germany, there's been a change of perspectives. The country has become more mixed, more diverse, which is welcomed by most, but violently rejected by some. And what does the younger generation think about the way things are developing? On To The Point this week, we ask German reunification, is it time for the next generation? Thanks very much indeed for joining us here on To The Point. And my guests here in the studio are Maitu Bui, who is an art student focusing on migration. And she argues that we in West Germany are rediscovering the Eastern German identity and we must learn from it. Also with us is Melanie Stein, journalist and psychologist, who says reunification shaped us, now we are shaping society. And a very warm welcome, too, to journalist and radio presenter Vladimir Balzer, who believes that today's united Germany is more diverse than ever, and we should embrace that. Thank you for being here, folks. Thank you for those three interesting statements. I'd like to begin with you, uh, my two. I called uh, German reunification in my introduction and the fall of the Berlin Wall a miracle because that's how it felt to me. I was there at the time and I was amazed by what I saw. What does it mean for you today? In the first place, it meant something for my parents. Um, after the reunification, it meant for them that the contracts terminated. My parents back then were contract workers. Just explain sort of you, uh, about the Vietnamese background and the contract workers in uh, East Germany. Um, starting in 1980, I guess, um, because that's when my father first came to East Germany. Mm. Um, Vietnam and East Germany back then had a contract um, in, during the Socialist um, Union mm -hmm. to um, invite um, Vietnamese contract workers in order to work for them in companies and stuff like that. Okay, that's important because many people, I think many of our viewers would not know that. And, and your parents and that community in Eastern Germany, did they celebrate German reunification? Was it, was it a joyous occasion for them? For them, it was a shock because their contracts would have terminated years later mm -hmm. and the ecosystem kind of um, fell apart. Mm -hmm. They had to um, start, start to be on their own to find ways in order to survive. Um, not only the contracts terminated, but also um, the living condition um, kind of uh, changed in a way. Okay. That's a, that's a fascinating introduction to your story. We'll continue on that just a little yeah. bit shortly. Uh, Melanie, 30 years of reunification. Are you celebrating? Or what is there to celebrate for, from your perspective? Um, well, I think we are just... I think um, the, the reunification is one of the biggest historic achievements of, of Germany, of course. Um, I think it's not, not a day you celebrate with your family. Um, and it's, maybe it's also because, um, you know, it, um, in, in the years when, when the unification happened or the year before, um, it was the people who were fighting for democracy. Mm -hmm. So the players um, from the peaceful revolution um, are not really um, the subject of this day. You understand? No, tell me. Explain <laughs> for me. <laughs> so, well, we had to we had the chance to um, create a new con constitution. Yeah. And we missed this chance, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it was more a symbolic act in a way and a takeover. And, um, Often described as a hostile takeover, the West taking over the East. Um, yeah, well, we, we had the, there were people um, creating a new constitution. They had great ideas uh, like uh, the right to work, the right to um, an apartment, environmental protection, things we discussed today. Yeah. But um, politicians decided to not do that, but um, decide, decided for the takeover. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason why people from the East and West didn't meet at eye level. Mm -hmm. And um, this was followed by some problems we are talking about today or the younger uh, generations talk about today. Okay, Vladimir, you were a young teenager at the time. Tell us about what your perspective was then and through to today. 
Well, the 9th of November 89 was actually more important to me than the 3rd of October 1990. Yeah. Uh, the fall of the wall, obviously, I've been 15 years of age and uh, my, my mother came into my room and said, I know this is, there's really something historical happening. And I wondered actually the next day, really, I've, I've been living in, uh, I'd lived in Leipzig at that time. Yeah. And I wanted to go to West Berlin, of course, the next day. What I did with most of my friends, so school was empty. It's been a Friday, I remember that. Uh, and this was just a great time, you know, really to, to see all these places, to meet people, and to see also the differences from the very beginning, actually. When I went to West Berlin, I suddenly noticed that this is another part of Germany. I wasn't really prepared for it, so. Um, and the 3rd of October, I mean, you have to remember, it's just it's less than a year later, less yeah. than a year. Uh, this um, the state of GDR, this East Germany, actually, you know, just disappeared from the earth. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very short period. Oh. Uh, Melanie was talking about how perhaps people in the East got a, got a raw deal, you might say, from, uh, from the West. And I'm just wondering, I mean... Yeah, I would contradict, okay, actually. I would contradict because it's been a democratic decision. There has been, like, uh, elections on the 18th of March in 1990, the first free election in East Germany, which mm -hmm. was there. And people decided, people voted, and they voted for the conservative movement, which was strongly, of course, uh, also supported by Helmut Kohl and his government and the CDU from the West. But still, the East German people decided themselves you know, what would happen to their country. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a takeover. The and that it was also because uh, Kohl um, said you will have... He promised a lot, yeah. Uh, he promised a lot. Too much. And only after one year later, um, people lost trust in the government. So you are absolutely right. It was the decision of the people. They knew um, what they did. But uh, it mm. was based on promises which were, were not hold. That's true. But well, that's nothing new in politics, I'd say. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I'm just wondering, my two, when we, uh, when we talk about the sort of the three decades of German reunification, do you do, and you listen to that discussion, and it's continuing, obviously, because with celebrations again uh, this year, uh, as usual. Mm. Do you sort of look at that discussion and think we should be moving on here? We should be moving away from that discussion and moving towards Germany's future as a more diverse, as a more, as a, yeah, as precisely that, as a more diverse society. I mean. In the first place, we have to acknowledge that Germany itself is already di diverse. Um, we have lived experiences that go beyond being Eastern or Western German. Mm -hmm. And for example, my story, but also like so many other stories that have been unheard because the story usually have been told from the West German perspective. Mm -hmm. And even um, East German people um, try to tell more of their stories. And I think they are valid to be heard. Vladimir, I'm just, I'd just like to come back to your sort of optimistic take on the process because, uh, you know, we all know that the, the, this, this term, this horrid term was used, the Aussies, to sort of almost look down denigratingly on people from the East. I'd just like to know, were you ever... To, t never, ever. Never? You were never called an Aussie? You never sort of... No. People were amazed when they realised I'm from the East, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're really from the East, is that true? Mm. I wouldn't have believed it. So they had their cliches in mind, obviously. You mm. know? Um, even my now wife, when we had our first two or three dates, she thought, I'm from the West. She's from the East. And uh, <laughs> it took at least three dates <laughs> uh, for her to learn that I'm actually also from the East. You know? so. so you adapted very well to the system. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Well, at the heart of Berlin, at the heart of German reunification, is Potsdamer Platz. Uh, once it was one of the busiest traffic hubs in the world, and it was later wiped from the map. But it's back, so what do people there say about uh, the coming together of East and West 30 years on? After reunification, Potsdamer Platz, in the heart of Berlin, became the biggest building site in Europe. Now it's once again a lively, bustling district. This is all that reminds people of where the wall once stood. Germany is one country. I never accepted East Germany. I'm glad it's gone. I knew the old East Germany. I was 10 at the time and felt very positive about it. What came next was a very tough time for us teenagers and kids because our parents lost everything. But looking back, I'd say it was nonetheless a good thing.
I think we're on the right track. In my generation, at the latest, you won't be able to tell who's from the east and who's from the west. Is that really the case? My too. I'm. Uh, I'm surprised. You know that that uh, that's sort of an aspiration here. To, to the people in the east and the west shouldn't be different. The the difference shouldn't be apparent. What do you say? I think um, we have to acknowledge the differences, not only between Western and Eastern German people, but also the varieties that ev that make the society diverse in a way mm -hmm. um, that we have to learn from those. Um, identities that we can acknowledge them com and feel compassion for them. Mm -hmm. Is that happening? Um, in some parts it is because, for example, my generation is speaking up about those um, pasts and histories which people don't know about yet and we hope that in the future um, German people in general, not Eastern or Western German people, mm -hmm will understand um, the history behind our existence. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It's, good. it's complicated stuff. Uh, Melanie, you, uh, you founded an initiative called We Are the East, young, mainly young, as I understand it, East Germans who are proud to be East Germans. What are they proud of? <laughs> well, they actually poke fun at the media because uh -huh. uh, the media sometimes say, well, the, the people from the East are like this and like this and they put them all in one box. Yeah. And um, this box is not very positive connotated. Mm -hmm. um, so alongside with the rise of right-wing populism, there were narrow-minded um, media reports. And uh, we thought uh, this is problematic because the majority, 80% who voted for democratic, democratic political parties mm -hmm. are not um, shown. And uh, so we th thought, okay, maybe we have to give them a platform. And so people on our platform tell about their story. Um, they, many of them, for the first time, uh, publicly um, talk on public mm -hmm. what they or their family actually experienced. Us, experienced. Give me, give so me an example. Give me an example. If you um, can. So um, one uh, very common example is that many people who are from the younger generation say, well, they didn't have parents who had that much time because people, of course, they were busy to find new jobs. Two thirds of the people in East Germany lost their jobs. And um, yeah, so they, they had to become mature very early. Mm -hmm. And uh, but also I think this gives them strength. So the experience of transformation is actually a skill we need nowadays. And this people, is what we also have learned how to reinvent enhance. themselves. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's really important. That's a very, very important point. I'm actually proud of many East Germans what they achieved actually in this 89, 90, and also in the 90s. And now they had to adapt to a totally different system, to a totally different political system. The word we use today is resilience. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think yeah. they. I mean. Not all, of course. I mean, not all. I mean, many, many, many lost uh, lost their jobs and had like uh, broken biographies and so on. Of course, of course, you know. Especially when you talk about minorities, by the way, for example, the Vietnamese minority or the uh, Cuban minority and so on. They had really, really problems, strong problems. So, but, right, but so you are not most of vigorously. Them, you did a good job. Yes, of course. <laughs> like um, it was a tough time back then, and it still is. It will always be a tough time. Even whenever a person migrates nowadays to Germany, they won't ever um, identify themselves with um, the German identity. Um, for example, I have um, uncles who moved to Germany even after um, my parents moved here. And for them, they will always be strangers. That's what they are um, telling themselves and that's what they tell us and the community. So um, I think it's also part partially because um, they experience um, the kind of, um, sorry, <laughs> they, they, they experience that um, their identity is not what being welcomed here. And this is- You're, being, you're being very, very cautious. Yes, I'm quite cautious, <laughs> cautious because um, my existence and my identity is um, in danger in the German society. Like when I go outside- How and why? I, I grew up um, with neo-Nazis in front of my door. We're talking about, I mean... It, uh, back then in the 90s. Back then in the 1990s especially. It yes. was a terrible decade in yeah. that respect, I think. And they're still How, there. So. It's still there. Yeah. Has it changed at all? 
Or is it still the same threat, the same level of threat to, to your well-being? When I was um, a child, um, I could identify them by wearing black or being skinheads. Nowadays, um, this kind of phenotype disappeared in a way. Um, mm. they, they kind of um, became the same like everyone else. And so it's very hard to identify the person who would put you in danger. Mm -hmm. um... One of the, uh, well, I, was on, I was on your site and I was looking at some of the statements that some of the people were making and one of the statements was um, that we, uh, we want people in the East uh, to be, oh, no, we want the East to be seen as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, okay, you want the East to be seen as an opportunity. What does that mean? That it isn't seen as an opportunity, that it is perhaps seen as something troubling why is that the case and why is it still the case, if it's true at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I mean, it is the, the case that um, more people in the eastern part vote um, for the AFD, and, but we have to ask the question... The far-right alternative for Germany party, 20%. Right, right. In most uh, areas of Eastern Germany, yes. Yeah. And but we shouldn't ask why do East Germans vote uh, that way, but uh, we should ask why could the AfD become that popular in this part of Germany? And your and answer to that question, question? Your answer to that question? There, is? there are many answers. One. Um, to me, in a nutshell. <laughs> well, so one quarter of the East German people have left, mainly academics. This is one reason uh, we didn't have the movement of 1968 um, in East Germany. And uh, I think the most important thing is we are missing a strong or a st the, st the civil society is not as strong as in West Germany. So we really, really um, um, need this, but we also need more people um, like in the media. We need more more East German perspectives, because mm. um, there, there, it is fact that East German people um, don't have that much, much trust in the media and in the government. And I think this is not surprising. Um, they had so, many, so much hope. Yeah. And, and then there were, you know, there was devaluation and um, job loss. And of course, they lost trust and their perspectives are not seen in the media. Uh, so we have to change these things and, and look what, what can we really do. OK, let's, let's try and keep all of that on board and look to the future a little bit. And if you really want to get a feel for how dynamic many parts of the former East Germany are becoming, then one place that you might go to is the city that gave us Vladimir, Leipzig. Leipzig is booming. It's among the fastest growing cities in Germany. It's buzzing with young creative people. It's being called the new Berlin. Its economy has been buoyant. Leipzig is like Berlin 10 or 15 years ago because there's so much going on. When you're young, you want to make things happen, and in Leipzig, you can. Leipzig has a very active, youthful startup scene. A lot of old buildings have been renovated, and the rents are relatively cheap. Major corporations are also well represented Porsche, BMW, and DHL, for example. Despite the enormous effort to catch up in the eastern states, productivity there is still 20% lower than in the west, and household income is still 12% lower. Polls show that 57% of Germans say the advantages of reunification outweigh the disadvantages. 15% say the opposite. Where does the future lie, in the east or the west? OK, let's take that question. Where does the future lie, in the east or the west? Well, it's, I don't know, it's difficult to actually answer that question because I think it lies in both parts. Mm -hmm. um, but from the East comes definitely a very innovative, um, uh, let's say, energetic kind of uh, movement, uh, what I would see at least for the, for the younger generation. Mm -hmm. uh, Leipzig is a good example, I think. I mean, we've seen that in, the, in, this, uh, in this little film. Are there uh, other places that you There could... are other places also. There's uh, places like, a little smaller places like Jena and mm -hmm. uh, Dresden is another place mm -hmm. which is booming. Uh, Potsdam, close to oh, Berlin, yeah. to uh, actually the former West Berlin. Um, there are some like urban urban areas uh, which are really uh, like on, on a good on a good way actually mm -hmm. towards uh, towards future, and of course on the other hand side you have like rural rural areas where it's much much more difficult actually yeah? where many especially young well educated 
that women left the place and uh, what's left are just uh, rather elder men with uh, less education. But this is not true for the city. So Leipzig is a very, very good example. And actually, as I'm, I grew up there in the 80s and mm -hmm. I studied there in the 90s, I really saw uh, a place uh, which embraced actually this, this new time and, uh, you know, the fall of the wall and yeah. everything what came afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it's a very good... Very good example, actually, for... My too. From your perspective, what can we learn from the East? We can learn from the East that the will to tell your story is definitely there, and we have to acknowledge that, um, mm -hmm. that we, as especially because we're talking from West Germany from here, um, that we have to find a way, like you said, um, to find not only ways, but also to educate people that the Eastern Germany is not... Um, the dark part of Germany, um, mm. like forever, because we have to find ways to support them, to um, build infrastructure and ecosystems in which they can flourish, and also, yeah. Yeah. We want to shape the future. That was your statement at the top of the show. How? How? <laughs> what, um, are the, what are the tools and what are the goals? Yeah, well... As, as I said, people who experience transformation themselves or through their parents, they have a certain skill they can use now. And um, we show these people. And so, for example, um, Michael Bumeyer is at our, our team. He has founded an association that staffles uh, basic in income and um, does research on it. We have people who create co-working spaces um, in the landscape. And, and so I think this is one um, big part of the, the skill of transformation. And also, I think, uh, well, people in East Germany, they did not inherit much, right? Um, so the country property um, was given to the West, um, um, West Germany. I need and to explain for our audience to just briefly, the, 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 in, in the Western part of Germany, there have been huge sums of, uh, of inheritances being passed from one generation to the next. That hasn't been the case in Eastern Germany, and very many people view it as simply and abjectly unfair. Yeah. Um, well, but it is also a chance because yeah. I don't um, take over the company of my parents. I have free choice and my parents will also support me because they couldn't do what they wanted in the GDR. And that's really a, a great opportunity. And I see really many, many um, great young people doing um, very um, influential things now we are having the digitalization. Absolutely. It can be really very engaging. Vladimir, your take. Yeah, well, uh, to be honest, uh, as I said, um, from East Germans, I mean, the whole Germany can learn from the from the East German story how you can adapt to new to new conditions and to a new situation and uh, to challenges. Um, uh, that's what the East Germans learned, and I think they are most of them. I'm still speaking of the rather younger generation, are much more resilient actually to anything what may happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, you know, when we have these, uh, I said earlier, we have these sort of annual celebrations and sometimes it's a case, a little bit of sort of going through the motions uh, here in Germany, talking about, you know, what was back then, what was, you know, that it was a very important juncture in German history. And one of the clichés that is often used in that context is that we, we all, perhaps, people in West Germany, people in East Germany, have walls in our heads still. Do you have a wall in your uh, no, head still? No, I, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so. I mean, I don't... I would say for myself, I don't have any walls in my head. Uh, my parents do, definitely. Mm -hmm. But that's, as I said, when, when we talk about East and West Germany and about reunification, we have to talk about generations. This may be another subject for another show, but yeah. um, it depends very much on how... What you what you actually experienced yourself, you know how you how your own life went, uh, how your biography was changed. Uh, so that's really important always to keep in mind. We're speaking of thirty years after, which is a long time. It's more than a generation. It's a know? paradox because yeah. it's a long time and a short time at the yeah. same time. But it is, it's it is three yeah. decades. Yeah, but this yeah. older generation also passes on some experiences, also some negative experiences, to the next generations, mm -hmm. tell their story, maybe their negative story, mm -hmm. and reproduce actually all these kind of of, uh, breaks and wounds and everything, what may have happened in, Over, in the past. Overcome the trauma. Yeah, because yeah, it was yeah. traumatic. Um, but for they many pass people. on this trauma, mm. which is a problem, mm. you know, to mm. the next generation. So this is what I'm slightly worried Psychologist about. Psychologist here. Will uh, be. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, um, I have to disagree um, on some part because 
studies show we share the same values. But if you ask an East German person, does the person from the West share your values, then 45% will say no. Mm -hmm. So um, there is this construct of East and West. I never felt like an East German. I was made an East German. Mm -hmm. I felt like a Northern person or European. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we really have to um, stop using these constructs. Very important point. I'd just like to get one more perspective from my two. Just, to, just tell me, in a, in a sentence, what is your vision for the future of Germany? I think what we just were talking about, that acknowledging that not seeing wars is a privilege and um, understanding how to use that privilege in order to support the non-privilege. Okay. To the point on German reunification. Thanks very much for joining us. If you've enjoyed the show, come back next time. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs>